All right, this is Frank Root here. We are back for our third video in the 22X4 build series. And this time we're gonna be building bags B and bag C. And I brought on another friend and TLR uh, team driver to join me in this video. We have uh, Ryan Harris. Hey Ryan, how are you today? Hey guys, how's it going? So we, I think it's uh, Ryan Styles Harris. I don't wanna you know, <laughs> play Styles too low key. So Ryan's one of our team drivers. Uh, pretty new to the team and out of the Florida area. And you guys probably know him already. He does lots of YouTube content for us and for the RC industry as a whole. But I'm going to give Ryan the floor for a minute here. He's going to introduce himself and kind of for the people that don't know him, you know, what he does in RC and uh, uh, how he feels about his time with TLR so far and uh, how things are going. Right on. Well, I appreciate it, Frank. I'm really excited that. Uh... You guys are taking the time to go through this new kit and kind of show everyone the ins and outs and answer a lot of crucial questions along the way. I think it's really important in establishing that confidence that you get when you're building a new kit, and especially when it's a new platform. You know, it's one thing if you're building like a slightly upgraded version of a previous kit. So I'm just really excited all this information is coming out there. And hopefully you guys have some questions that you can dump to me and Frank and mostly Frank. He's going to answer. He's the brains behind the operation. When I don't know something, I just ask him. But Anyways, um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Ryan Harris. Uh, I like to race RC cars. been doing it a long time. Uh, been in the scene kind of like my whole life-ish, like since I was three, and uh, raced with my dad up until like the later teen years, and then had to take a little bit of a break. Got back in about three years ago now, and uh, been kind of trying a little bit of everything. And then this, at the end of last year, uh frank and all the tlr guys it kind of made sense you're like hey time to come on home man we know you raced lucy back in the day so uh let's get back to it so it's been fun ever since and it's been really fun uh learning a lot along the way um i think that it, it it's really helpful when you can kind of step outside your comfort zone for a second you know what i had with the ae cars but a lot of that information was just going off of what other people were telling me. So to be able to come out here and not have a dominant yet, yet, keyword yet, not yet dominant a presence of TLR here in Florida, um, it's been fun learning on my own, asking the team guys lots of questions. Uh, Aaron Kaufman, he's been really helpful. Tom Rinderneck's been really helpful. Frank has been tremendously helpful. So it's just been really good so far and I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. So thank you, Frank. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I've been really happy to have you on the team. Uh, I know you're doing good things for us there in Florida and we're going to, like you said, we're going to continue to grow our presence there. Um, it's, uh, it's been an associated hotbed for a while and we just got to kind of take it back over. So uh, slowly but surely we'll get guys on the team. And uh, I think having the new four wheel out and the eight X elite is going to go a long way towards doing that. So, cool. uh, all right. So we got Ryan on board. Uh, that way, when I'm building these uh, bags here, you don't just have to hear me talk to myself. Uh, and Ryan can help with some of the questions that we're going to get. And he can also add any tips that he found uh, when he was building his uh, 22X4 or any of the other uh, TLR vehicles that he has. So we're going to go ahead and switch over to the table view now. And I'm going to go ahead and get going with bag B, which is the slipper assembly here. I have my instruction manual here to the side. I got to be honest, I don't really use it much, but it's good to have it here uh, in case I need it. And I know most people will probably be using it. So I'm going to go ahead and open bag B here, always cutting away from myself uh, just to be safe. And I'm going to go ahead and switch over this time. I'm going to use the yellow rag this time. Last time we used the parts tray and just cut open all these bags, get all the parts out. Uh, nice thing about the yellow rag is that I don't know about you, but I've never had an RC part this color, right? <laughs> it's true I'm trying to think maybe some springs back in the day when we used to run the colored springs but that's about it yeah that's so the nice thing about this is you can see all the parts on it usually very very easily uh so so we got our uh couple spur gears here we got a 78 and an 81 for spec racing and for modified we got our slipper pads our plates our uh, slipper shaft and the out drive collar spring some pins some other little hardware. So, all right. So the slipper assembly is actually probably the easiest part of the build. I think uh, it goes very fast and very straightforward uh, as long as you do it in the right order of steps. So we're going to go ahead and take our 
uh, shaft here and go ahead and grab one of our long pins. You'll notice there's two long pins and a short pin, so make sure you grab a long pin. And then you want to grab the slipper plate that has a cone shape to it, but doesn't have this little nub on it. So I'm going to grab this, uh, this guy and kind of see that it's got the cone shape to it, but it's flat on the other side. You go ahead and slide that over cone shape down. Then you're going to take your spur gear. I'm going to use an 81 because that's what I run and modified. And you have two different sides of the gear. You have this side with kind of a deeper octagonal pattern. And then you have this side that has a shallower uh, edge, which you'd normally see like on our two-wheel drive cars. You're going to go ahead and drop a slipper pad into that. Make sure it's lined up properly. And then what I do is I actually just hold this and let gravity help. And then I'll take the other assembly and just kind of slide it in. And you'll see it kind of moves around uh, for now. You know what? That's awesome. I used the wrong one. So you actually want to use the one with the nub. My bad. I haven't built a slipper in a minute. So it's okay have as long as we notice. Oh, sorry, Frank. I was just going to ask. Have you been mostly running the uh, gear diff then? Yeah, I have run the slipper some. Um, I do. I do like the feel of the slipper sometimes. It's kind of layout dependent. Uh, you said you ran yeah, most, greedy, most, didn't you? I did. I did. So, uh, yeah, at the Reedy race, there was a really tricky uh, jump section, right? It was uh, single, double, triple, turn, triple. And timing of those jumps was so critical to what your ultimate lap time was. And they were hard to do without crashing. And when I ran the slipper, I felt like it was easier for me to time them. Um, just a little bit more consistent without any of the power bleed that you get from running a center diff. So a lot of times that power bleed is what makes a center diff um, easier to drive. Mm. But for me on this layout, if I couldn't do that jump section, then the rest of it really didn't matter that much. So I put that in and I could jump the jump section. And so I stuck with it. Okay. It's um, not to bring up or mention any unmentionable words, but the B64 I used to run, uh, we really liked running the, the gear diff in there and I've been running gear diff in my four wheel pretty much ever since because I've become so accustomed to the way it feels that now I'm actually curious, like, wait, I've never run a slipper before or well in a long, long time. So I want to put it back in my 22 x four just to see what it feels like. Cause I tend to actually like that punchy feel more than the, you know, the easy to drive feel just to get that like explosiveness out of a corner. So I'll be curious to see what it feels like. Yeah, I think uh, for me in 13.5, even at a track where I would traditionally prefer a center diff for mod, I do like the slipper better for 13.5. Mm. So if I'm a, and, and that's why the slipper is included in the kit, because between everybody that's going to run a carpet is going to run a slipper. And then if you're running 13.5, I think you're probably more likely to run a slipper than to run a center diff. So that's the reason why we went with slipper in the kit over center diff. Uh, if you're running 13.5 on clay, for me, I would order a center diff kit and I would try both ways because it's mm. such an important part of how these four wheel drive cars work that it's definitely worth uh, trying both ways. Mm. Yeah, for me, so. I was running it at a lot of outdoor dirt clay tracks, you know, running hole shots pretty much all day long. So having like the really loose conditions, I knew I probably wanted to run a gear diff. So I've just been running that ever since. But now I'm getting ready to dial in some carpet setups so i know that I'm, okay definitely have to put my slipper in there get it all dialed in and then i want to have it on hand next time i go to a high bite dirt track and then i can just like try them both out and see what they feel like yeah no, i feel you uh all right so we'll get back to this build here real quick um all right so basically i got the spur gear here on and i kind of have my other finger behind it just kind of holding it together so that that slipper pad doesn't come unseated uh, and then I'm going to put another pad in here. Uh, it's going to drop right in. And then you take uh, this plate here that has no, uh, it's just flat. There's no features to it. It has this kind of rectangular-ish shape in the middle. And you slide that over. And it fits into the other hub. So you, you make sure that they line up there. And then you're going to take... The, the other long pin here and slide it across and it'll basically hold that guy in place and then you take your last your third slipper pad slide it into the spur gear and then you take your last slipper plate which does have that cone shape on one side and is flat on the other 
and then you slide it over and you just kind of twist it till you line it up with the pin. Make sure that everything's seated. And then you can kind of hold it all together. And that's pretty much the slipper assembly there. So there's three slipper plates, three slipper pads. All right. And then now we're going to drop the spring over. And then we have a washer here that goes between the spring and the spring collar. Then you have your spring collar here. And just so you guys know, you got two sides. You got one side that's flush and then one side that has like a counter bore inside of it that and it has a lip on the outside. And you want that to go down over the spring. So the, the washer is going to basically sit on that flat spot and it's going to capture the spring so that the spring doesn't go anywhere. And then you thread it on. And when I thread it, anything on, especially metal parts to metal parts, I'll always actually go the opposite direction counterclockwise until I feel the threads click over. That way I know that I'm aligned and I'm not going to cross thread. And then I just thread them on by hand until I can see, basically I want to see the entire uh, hole there in the shaft and then maybe like a half thread up top. So now I'm going to take the small short pin. I'm going to slide that in turn it sideways so that it won't fall out. Then you take your out drive here and you just slide it over that pin. Okay. Then you're gonna take your M3 by six millimeter screw here. And I think this is really important. You wanna use like an electronic cleaner or a brake cleaner and you wanna clean this screw off thoroughly uh, and get all the oil off of it. And you'll see here on this yellow rag I kind of twist it out like I'm unscrewing it from the threads, but you see, see all that black that's left there. I mean, that's all oil that was going to be on these threads instead of the Loctite being on the threads. And then I'll just put a good drop of Loctite on this guy and then screw it in the end. So have you run the slipper yet, Ryan? Full disclosure, I have not. I know I need to. And we actually have a question here in the chat. Um, we got one. Where was it? Jose Sanchez is asking, how bad would it be if you use the 81 tooth spur gear for spec racing? No, not at all. Um, I know Matthew Willoughby was running it in his car for a while because um, he thinks that the whenever you run a larger spur gear, you get more of like a torquey feeling, even without increasing motor temps. Mm. Uh, so he was actually running... Uh, I want to say it was running like 2581, uh, where I was running like a 2478. So the only downside is that the motor is just further away from the center line of the car, but you can fit it uh, within the motor mount, no problem. Okay. Um, so so oh, we have another one there if you've got time for another question. Well, I'll just run through this real quick. I just okay. take a uh, like 2.5 wrench and I run it through the other outdrive on the other end since the two outdrives are locked together. And that lets me get a good amount of torque on this screw to make sure that it's tight. Um, you definitely don't want to strip it out because that's no fun, but you need to make sure that this screw is tight, tight, because if it's not, it will come loose. So that's our slipper assembly. Um, one thing we'll do real quick is we'll just set it and then we'll, we'll jump into that question. Um, so and we got a M3 uh, set screw here, and I'm going to also clean this real quick. Now this one doesn't really tend to come loose, so it's not quite as critical, but I'm still gonna put a little thread lock on it. And there's two holes here in this uh, spring collar that you can see one side is threaded and one side is not. So just make sure that you use the uh, threaded side. And then what you wanna do is start to put that set screw in and leave the wrench in it. And then you wanna turn the collar all the way back until it gets flush, until there's no more gap between the outdrive and the collar. And then you want to go in one turn and use the hole on the other side to see the flat spot on the shaft and then kind of snug down the screw on the flat spot. And it is important to, to snug it down on the flat spot because if you do snug it down on the threads a couple of times, it's going to be really hard for that collar to go around because you'll put some new damage those threads a little bit because it is a steel screw. So make sure you get on the flat spot. And then uh, once you have it in the car, 
all you have to do to adjust it is just back the screw off like a turn and then you can uh let's see this would be loosen it and then this would be tightening it and you can go in half turn increments uh with that flat spot so there's your 78 81 center diff assembly so all right you said you had a couple questions Oh, uh, yeah, just an interesting one there from uh, Ray Melendez. He said, why no groove in the slipper plate like in the two-wheel drive car? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's this new slipper material, that uh, slipper pad material that we have that is the, uh, we call them like the Max Drive. Uh, it's like the more orangey material. Uh, or if it's just the fact that we have three plates. But on this car, we didn't really notice uh, much of a benefit to running those. Um, and it definitely is something that, that costs more to machine those grooves after the fact. It's actually pretty expensive because you're having to machine something through the hard anodizing, which is hard on tools. Mm. So um, we didn't really find a benefit, so we didn't include it. And that was it. So I'm going to go ahead and put the slipper assembly up here with my diffs that I built in the last video. Um, do you have another question or do we want to get into the turnbuckles? Let's see. Just a comment there from Brian Junker says, great work on the cars, guys. Looks great. Hashtag Team Lucy Racing. Nice. I like it. Looks like people are excited about the car and I am too. Yeah. Hopefully we can all get back out and race them soon. Yes. That's the next step. So, all right, we're going to jump into the turnbuckles here. Um, I build my turnbuckles a certain way. Lots of people have different ways of building them. Uh, a lot of guys will use like a drill. Um, I, I, uh, or sometimes like chapstick. I use black grease and I use hand tools. Um, I don't want to say building turnbuckles is anybody's favorite part of the car, but I definitely don't mind it as much as most people do. I don't think. Um, I know my Ben, my friend Ben and I, I used to build all the, turnbuckles and he would build all the shocks so we kind of trade off that way he's not like building shocks but um here what i always do with my turnbuckles before i assemble them on the car and you if you follow the instructions you're obviously going to get them all correct uh but i like to lay my turnbuckles out uh the way that they would basically fit on the car and mm. that allows me to make sure that i have all the collars kind of facing the right way and i have all the ball cups in the right location and i have all the the right length turnbuckles in the right place uh, so we have 50 millimeter turnbuckles for the front camber links and the rear camber links. And then we have 45. So there's three shorter turnbuckles and that's for the servo link. And then the two steering tie rods, uh, we use straight ball cups in all the camber links and on the steering link and on the inside, uh, steering tie rods and then the angled ball cups, uh, they go, just because I haven't built one in a day or two, they go like this, where the left actually goes on the right and the right actually goes on the left because they curve it in, where on the two wheel they curve around. So these ones curve in. So now I have my kind of layout there, and this is just makes me sure, keeps me straight, especially when you have like the angle turnbuckles or you have different length turnbuckles. It makes it easy so that you can have everything lined up and you don't accidentally put one on the wrong direction or put the curved one on a long turnbuckle when it needs to be on a short one, et cetera. Um, and then what I do, I do is I take black grease and I just grease all the ball cups at once. I put quite a bit into the whole the end of the ball cup. I mean, pretty much let it fill up. Uh, you can't really put too much in because when you thread them in, anything that's extra will pop out. And I'll show you that. You used, uh, what do you use on your ball cups, Ryan? Uh, so it's funny you mentioned the drill and chapstick method because that's that's actually how I do it. But you can't, I mean, I guess you can do the whole ball cup with the drill, but normally I just do one side with the drill and then the other side I have to do it by hand because it gets a little wonky if you just like stick it in the chuck. Yeah. But it does awesome. make it go faster. And sometimes if I'm feeling like really extra and I'm determined to get the turnbuckle I'm not like get popped off or something the first time I go to adjust them, I'll pre-drill all of the ball cups before and then go and build them after that point, just so that they're a little bit easier to adjust. Okay. So what I use is I use some regular uh, style pliers here. And 
you can see you got a nice uh you got these nice teeth in the end uh you don't want I, you actually want the teeth you don't want them to be flat and i'll show you why so what i do is i actually take the ball cup and i actually grab basically put the point of the ball cup in between two of the teeth now if you do this and you hold it tight and it doesn't slip you'll never mark up the ball cup because you actually have a lot of surface area touching between the point and the teeth. So this ball cup from over here, this turnbuckle, and I'm gonna go ahead and thread it in. What I'll do is I'll do about a turn, turn and a half, enough to where I feel it grab with my fingers. Make sure, you know, kind of look this way and then you look this way and make sure it's, it's straight. So you're threading it in pretty straight. And then I basically put this guy on and I actually just run my finger around and around and around and around. And this works pretty good. I mean, every once in a while, you're going to drop the, the wrench off. But you want to go all the way. So you see there's like this little uh, angle here at the top of the threads. You actually want to go all the way to the top of that angle. And that's fully threaded. And you can see how much grease came out. Because once you basically put enough pressure on the air that's behind the turnbuckle, the air has to blow through and it pushes some of the grease out. So I'll do that. I'll wipe the grease off and then I will unthread these a little bit. And I never, um, you know, we have dimensions in the kit. I never build to the dimensions of the turnbuckles. I always just get them close, make sure that they're equal from side to side and then adjust them while they're on the car. Do you go by the, uh, the instructions, Ryan, in terms of the lengths? If I'm building a kit, like a platform for the first time, I'll use that as a reference point to get it like close, but I also know that there's going to be some variables once you're completely done with the kit, uh, as far as like final adjustments. So that adjustment is most likely going to have to be modified just a little bit to get all your toe and camber correct according to the setup that you're going to use and all that stuff. So yeah, I, sometimes I will if it's new, but if it's a kit that I've built before, I usually just do it exactly like you just said all the way in. And then I adjust it once it's on the car. Yeah, so this this is a turnbuckle that's done. And one thing that I always try to do is, like I said, you want to thread all the way up and then you got to back it back out a little bit. I try to make sure that I have equal amount of threads on both sides showing. And what that allows for is it allows you to get to your shortest possible measurement. Because if you have more threads on one side than the other, then one side's going to bottom out before the other side can bottom out. And you're not going to get the shortest possible setting without having to take it apart or pop it off the car. So... That's one turnbuckle. Now, building the next seven is more of the same. So I figured this would be a good time for some questions and for Ryan and I to kind of chat it up while I build these turnbuckles. Absolutely. So. Um, fresh off the chat, Pierre Raymond says, will that car be for sale? Well, a 22X4 is probably for sale at your local hobby shop. <laughs> yes. So technically, I'm not supposed to say that they're shipping, uh, but I know that on Facebook this morning, I've seen hobby shops that have them in stock on the shelves. Uh, uh, hobby Action, I saw uh, Pacific Coast Hobbies, Bill's Hobby Shop. Um, did you see any different ones? I, I, I know I've seen more than that. Those are just the ones that I'm kind of coming up off the top of my head. Oh, I don't know specifically, but I know that I saw at least three or four different hobby shops take a picture of them, you know, sitting on their, their counter or on the shelf in their shop there saying first come first serve. And I saw a couple of them that were even being uh, aware of the, um, maybe they have to do it, you know, curbside delivery. So either way they're, they're out there somewhere. If, if you're fortunate enough. Yeah. Curbside delivery is better than no delivery. So that's true. And, uh, we did make the post last week, but I just want to reiterate, I mean, horizon, uh, Horizon Hobby is, you know, one of the larger distributors in the U.S. And, uh, you know, Team Losi Racing obviously is sold through Horizon. Uh, but I just want to encourage everybody to try and support their local hobby shops during this time. I mean, mm. even if you don't want to go pick one up, I mean, pretty much any hobby shop can put a kit in a box and ship it to you. And uh, with map pricing that Horizon has, you're getting the same price regardless of where you buy. So if you have a track that you enjoy racing at, I'd, I would uh, recommend buying your kit from them because if you put money in their pocket, then they can stay open and then you have a track to go play at. That I have a very brief story 
that actually is incredibly relevant to what you just said, Frank. When you can support a local hobby shop, for me personally, when, okay, long time ago, early 90s, I was like four or five years old. My dad was just getting me into the hobby. Our local hobby shop was where we went. Phil's Hobby Shop in Pinellas Park, Florida. He was in the Coast Guard. He got deployed to go to Kodiak, Alaska. No hobby shop, no internet. This is pre-1999. So my dad would call the hobby shop from time to time. And because he had established a relationship with them, they would send him stuff. And whenever he needed something or some bonus stuff, they would just keep him occupied because it was a very, very dark and dreary and snowy and rainy place to live. But the little bit of RC stuff that we got got us through and arguably kept us in the industry. So huge, huge, huge shout out to our local hobby shop. I think that they do a lot more for our industry than people give them credit for. Yeah, I mean, we're specifically, I mean, we're, we're uh, you know, part of Team Losey Racing and part of a big, big part of what we do is race. And in the U.S., at least, there's very, very few tracks that are clubs. They're all part of a hobby shop business, right? Um, so if you don't have a hot local hobby shop, then you don't have a track because, let's face it, the tracks are not very profitable on their own, right? They require sales through their hobby shop to augment the um you know the 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 sales that they get through the hobby shop and both of those things together can sustain business um but one of those things uh alone you know can't especially the track side Mm. so um i saw um hunter posted that classic rc has them uh has five we'll have five in stock tomorrow uh, in Crestview, and then I know that uh, somebody posted that SDRC has some in stock, and OCRC has some in stock. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's a couple posts there I saw. Um, I saw. Let's see. Somebody asked, uh, why not use the HD ball cups with the hole in the ball cup? Uh, that's uh, Jose Angel Sanchez. Uh, we those ball cups were just never as good as these ball cups when it comes down to it. I and mean, they had the hole in them, which was nice. But they had more um, more slop in them. They didn't fit quite as tight, and they popped off a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. And we actually spent a ton of time trying to get them right, and we could just never get them uh, to where our you know top end team guys would would run them over running these standard ball cups because the fit of these is so much better and they stay tight. So we just started putting these back in the kits because that's what our uh, drivers wanted. And I think when our drivers want something, it's generally something that the customer is going to want too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jim Silve says, Frank borrowed my pliers 15 years ago. Now I know where they ended up. Jim Silve would say that. <laughs> yeah, Jim, uh, Jim's a good guy. He races uh, on TLR, but he lives in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, or in that area, he races a hobby action. And when I first started my RC uh, venture career, whatever you want to call it, uh, I was actually racing. Uh, asphalt oval and at the track that i raced at jim was like a god amongst men i mean like i could count probably on one hand the amount of club races he would lose in a year um and then you know he would travel nationally and he was an a main guy i think he won a couple races uh like nationals and such too so he was ultra fast um and still gets around pretty darn good on the off-road scene so yeah we're just building some ball cups here and this is why i combined the slipper video and the uh the ball cup video because honestly it's they're both pretty straightforward not too hard not too much to them not too much explanation needed um you're just gonna go ahead and keep building these uh if you guys have any questions now's a great time to post them if it's for me if it's for the 22x4 or if it's for uh ryan uh, any questions that that you might have for ryan would be great oh we got one from uh, Mr. Ryan Benedict says, what weight diff oils are you guys running for clay? I'm assuming he's referring to the 22X4. Um, Frank, what are you running? Uh, so from Desert Classic, I ran 7, uh, 500, 4. Seven, five, and that's four. what Dakota ran also. Nice. And I can say exactly the same. Um, there was one track where I was really, really hunting for grip. And I tried like seven 100 
uh, five, but it just, I didn't need it. It's four wheel drive car. So I was able to keep it at like 200 and up pretty much every time I've run the car. Yeah, I think really like you're either going to run um, 200 or 500 in the center or maybe kind of a mix of the two. Mm. Um, I think uh, I know Tom Rinderneck runs um, 300K. I think maybe Ultimate Racing sells that. I was going to say, where's he getting that stuff? <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think it's Ultimate Racing um, makes 300K. Uh, so, yeah, that's that would be a good option too, kind of to split the split the difference. I, in case someone's going to ask, commenting on that, uh, I did try like some higher diff weights and it got the car to like come out of the corner a little bit more aggressive, but I lost all of, not all of it, but a, too much of the magical entrance and corner speed that I felt the car just naturally produces when I went up to those higher diff foils. So I just went back to the seven and five versus doing like a, a 10 and a seven or something like that. Did Have you thought anything about that kind of stuff frank yeah so i've actually i've actually gone up before um gone up to like 10 7 instead of 7 4 just trying to kind of almost slow the car down and, and have it rotate a little bit slower and for me it almost can rotate faster like it almost has this feeling where the yeah it, it is easier on the inside tire but almost like the outside tire is actually pulling the car around the turn even faster mm. So for me at re race, I actually went down in diff well and it made my car easier to drive because it just let the diffs do their thing and be more forgiving. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, you know, we're still, uh, it's obviously, it's a different, much different type of car than we've run in the past. So I still think we have a little bit of learning, uh, to do with that. But I mean, to be completely honest, the car has been so good with seven, four or seven, five, that we've pretty much just been running that and not really messing with it a whole lot. So uh, one thing I'll point out real quick as I'm building this steering turnbuckle um, is that the steering, these angled ball cups, because they have the angle in the end, the turnbuckle can't actually go all the way up to the, the top of the shank. It actually can only go to the bottom of the shank here on the turnbuckle. So whenever I build a, like a steering turnbuckle where I have one of these angled ball cups, I actually intentionally leave two extra threads on the angled ball cup side versus the other side because then they will still both bottom out at basically the same uh place side to side for what it's worth didn't know that i actually always built it just centered just on equal on both sides so thank you frank for dropping some knowledge yeah that's why we try and you know i think that's why these videos are good because it's not i mean i think every most people can get a car together but if it can be easier, uh, you know, then uh, it just makes things better. You know, I've always been willing uh, and open to sharing uh, setup tips, tricks, whatever, building tips. Like it, to me, it's um, most of what I learn or most of what I know I've learned from somebody else. So why would I not take that and pass it back uh, as much as I can? Ooh, I actually have a question for you, Frank. Have you played sure. around with the different, um, I believe you are calling them mud guards, as far as the soft versus the Stifazel? Yeah, a little bit. Um, we tried the Stifazel mud guards quite a while ago. I I think the soft ones are just better. Um, the the four-wheel drive car, especially, it when you run the softer um, softer mud guards and and I don't, people probably notice we have a lot of pocketing in the chassis intentionally to give it, give it extra flex. Mm. Um, and when we run the car softer like that, it just allows the car to absorb so much more and to be so much more forgiving um, for me. And it, it actually gains consistency. It doesn't lose it. Uh, so that's kind of the key there for me is that it feels like we, you know, it's just easier to drive and it doesn't lose any speed. It gains a little bit of grip. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, it's definitely, it's not a super expensive part. So when you have a chance, I'd suggest giving it a try. Um, and, uh, especially on carpet, I mean, carpet seems to be where I like more chassis flex, but you know, you're running 13, five, not modified. So maybe you're going to be looking to lose more grit than I'm looking to gain type of thing. I don't know. It's something that I accidentally 
found that I like tremendously more on my two wheel car to run the soft side rails on pretty much everywhere because uh, it suits okay. my driving style. Um, I don't like the stiff ones because it just makes the car a little bit more aggressive feeling. Uh, and I just like how into the track I can feel with the soft. So I was like, hmm, I wonder if I should try the stiff cell if it would be similar or different with the four wheel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I think it's actually it's pretty similar of a change. I think the four wheel drive just being that it already has more grip uh, and generally it's just faster. Mm. Everything happens faster. So the slower that the chassis, like the more that the chassis can just kind of absorb those things instead of deflecting them and making different things happen as the mm. car goes around the track, the better. So, um, so yeah, so we got all the turnbuckles done. I got my, my rear, my steering, my two, uh, steering link, and then my front camber links. The one thing I'm going to do right now, um, and like I said, I don't really generally measure these to match the manual. Um, I usually adjust them once they're on the car, except for the steering link. I will measure that one real quick. And that's actually the first one that we build. And that one needs to be 23.4 uh, gap. So we got to go a little bit tighter on that. And we'll just do that real quick. And again, make sure you do both sides. All right, got to get out the pliers. I got a question from chat from Mr. Benedict again. He's asking if you've used the carbon front steering gearbox brakes. On carpet, yes. Um, on dirt, we haven't really found it um, the need to run it. So yeah, yes and no. Um, it's definitely something that you could try, but I think when we, when I tried it on dirt, I almost thought that it made the front of the car feel more direct, um, which isn't something that we I really found myself looking for out of the car. Um, it's almost like that extra flex just lets the car deflect um, some of the things that, that are happening to it and actually just makes it a little smoother. So on carpet, it's too much. There's just, there's too much flex. So mm -hmm. um, there's too much grip. So I think it's too much. So yeah, so we got 23.39, which is pretty close to 23.4. And then the other thing that I always do is I always measure my two um, steering links because you definitely need these to be equal to each other. So it's not necessary that I really hit the perfect measurement. It's just that they're equal to each other. So one is 24.3 and the other is 24.1. So I'll just lengthen this guy just a smidge. And the reason why it's important for your steering links to be the same length is that if this link, let's see, we'll move the rest of these out of the way. If this link is longer than this one and the wheels are straight on the car, then the steering assembly actually has to be crooked, right? To mm -hmm. get the wheels straight. And if the steering assembly is crooked, then as these points move forward and move backward, they change the angle of the steering links and that controls your Ackerman. So if you don't have everything square on the inside and square on the outside to each other, side to side, then you end up with a different Ackerman left versus right. And nobody needs that. So that's why it's always important to measure those. Just make sure that they're equal. Then when you put them on the car, you adjust each side a quarter turn at a time, and then they always stay equal. You never have to measure them again. Super so, important right, stuff. That's, yeah. Um, that, so that's building the turnbuckles and the slipper assembly. You can kind of see, I have a slipper center diff front and rear diff that we did on the previous video. And I got all my turnbuckles here. I have a couple extra 78 tooth gears here that I'm just going to set off to the side. And, uh, I really want to thank Ryan for coming on and, uh, helping out, keeping, keeping everybody from getting bored while I'm just building, you know, seven different turnbuckles. I appreciate it, Frank. It's been a lot of fun answering all these questions and just talking shop. Always a good time. Yeah. Do we? Did you see any more questions pop up? We can handle a couple more here before we jump off. Um, we had one from Hunter, and I was going to answer it, but I'm not sure. Uh, is the aluminum motor mounts already in the kit? Oh. Can you still hear me, Frank? Sorry. 
Gotcha. 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 G